I've come up with a game called Artifact Pursuit, and the whole point of it is to get the children really engaged in their own line of inquiry. It's an artifact. It is an artifact, and inside I've got some more to show you. I start by bringing a suitcase into the classroom filled with items from the post-war period. This gets children's attention straight away and creates an air of mystery, really engaging the class. I draw each item out of the suitcase and as I do that I start to model questioning to the children. Where would someone go in a dress like this? Merle, would you place that dress in square number three? Basically it's a board game. Each group has a large counter and they throw their dice. Whichever number it lands on, they take their counter to the square with that number. They take the artifact back to their table where they're able to examine it more closely. So I'd like you to visit four squares and record your questions and answers on your card. And I'd like you to do that in 35 minutes. I expect the children to visit a certain number of squares within a time limit. This makes it more exciting, it feels like a game and it keeps them on task. Children think they're just playing a board game, but actually I'm interested in the kinds of searching questions that they're beginning to ask in their group. So it's a good idea to give them a prompt sheet with some question words on, like who, where and why. Yeah, we could buy, we basically, we could buy all this from one supermarket, whereas they go to different shops. Yeah. Some squares have wild cards on them, and on each wild card is a little task, a piece of research to do in a different part of the classroom. This adds to the excitement of the game, and it also means that children are just beginning to carry out research as well as ask questions. Okay, your game of Artifact Pursuit is over. Well done. Now, did you rise to the challenge? In subsequent lessons, these questions that they've asked themselves will be put into research projects that the children will carry out, and that gives them a really big sense of satisfaction. Excellent. Who managed more than four? Wow. This is a great lesson idea because the children love it. It gets them moving around, and they're able to engage with actual artifacts from the past, which is really memorable learning for them. Using a character line is a very versatile tool and lends itself very easily to many tasks in history. It allows children to understand that people are not necessarily all good or all bad and that sometimes understanding an opinion of different people's actions can change over time. Sometimes in history we make judgments about people on the basis of what we know about them. You're going to be looking at a character, Elizabeth I, and you're going to decide whether she was a good or a bad person. Elizabeth I is a very interesting character in history. She's regarded as a good queen, but actually when the children start researching actions that she was responsible for, there are some areas where her character is more called into question. If I were to put a statement in the middle, what do you think that might indicate? Kieran. Good and bad. Good and bad. It's very unlikely that someone is all good or all bad. I begin the lesson by modelling three different statements about Elizabeth I. 
as a class, we're going to decide whether they would indicate whether she was a good person or a bad person, or in fact, it was very difficult to decide on the basis of that particular information. We've looked at three statements, and you've decided where to place them on the character line. On your tables, you have your own character line, and you've got a selection of other statements. In your groups, you're going to have to decide where you want to place them. OK, over to you then. Expanded British territory over... So that's good. So that's on your side. That's in the middle. So that one's worse, and then it goes that way. Yeah. So where should we put that there? The exciting thing about the use of the character line is that you can use it at any stage, and it would be a very interesting way of introducing a topic. To begin with, they may well make a decision about Elizabeth, and at the end of the topic, you may want to repeat the exercise and see whether the decisions are still the same. I would say that she isn't that nice. She's good. She's helping poor people. I'd say that. Um, the children, when they're carrying out research, often come across information which is very difficult to categorise. So, for example, the children are quite horrified that she didn't bathe very regularly, but in Elizabethan times, this was quite normal and wouldn't be seen necessarily as a bad thing. I don't know what this one is. That's it. It's like healing yeah, this the good people. Created poor laws. I don't think it's important that the children have any prior knowledge. I'm going to be providing them with this information on this occasion. But in a similar exercise, it could be that you are asking children to carry out research independently or in groups and bring that information ready to start the task. Yeah, she was the first person who actually felt that there was some need to look after people that were less fortunate than others. So she created benefits for people that needed help. Children are often surprised that Elizabeth, who is often shown in a good light, was actually responsible for things that the children regard as really quite gruesome. For example, she was responsible for imprisoning her sister for 20 years. So look at your character line, that's pretty grim as well. But actually you think it was an even worse action when she had her killed? Yeah. Yes? Right. OK, good. At least she's alive there. Yes. yes. You can, if you wish, end this type of lesson on a vote. This is a very immediate way of both me and the children arriving at a conclusion as to what it is that children have decided. Okay means there are some groups that haven't voted. Why is that? Because she's done about the same amount of good things as she has bad. So was she neither good nor bad? Was she a mixture? We're going to create another category. Put your hands up if you think you feel that she would be in this category. The character line will enable the children to develop their inquiry skills. Children are looking at the information and they're having to evaluate it. This is very important as they progress in their understanding of historical events. That's every group. Today we're going to be looking very carefully at some historical sources and deciding what we think about them. I've called this activity Luckiest Historian because children begin to weigh up different kinds of evidence and decide what's really valuable to them. When we're describing sources of evidence, what words would we use? Jacob? Primary and Prim secondary. Primary and secondary. It's always a good idea to start with the words primary and secondary. These are exactly the kind of words that I want children to start using in my history lessons. What's a primary source of evidence, Theo? Like a diary. Oh, an or example is a diary. Because it was written at the time that we are studying. I start by introducing the three R's, relevant, reliable and rich. I want them to think about what those words mean in the context of being a historian. Is it a rich source? What might that mean? Tom? It's got, it's got lots of detail in it, the kind of detail that you want. That's exactly right. A rich source of evidence will have lots and lots of detail that will tell us 
what it was like to live in that time. One of the points of this lesson is to really challenge the assumption that children often make that printed and published sources of evidence are the most valuable ones. In this envelope I've got a collection of historical sources of evidence cards that you're going to sort through today according to those words that we've looked at. Okay, Some of them are primary and some of them are secondary. I've got website, diary extract, newspaper article, sound recording, film archive and oral history. I'd like you to put these cards in order across your table, most reliable, least reliable. Off you go in groups of three. What I find is that children are really good at describing sources of evidence but it doesn't come so easily to them to question and to be discerning about which ones to choose and I find this activity really gets them thinking about those things. I think this should be in front of diary extracts because normally these are best in fact whilst they can be making stuff up in diary but they can have this lesson's really great because it's not about learning facts, it's not about knowledge, it's about children's thinking skills. It's about ordering, it's about making choices and it's about discussion. Matthew, can you explain to me why you've put film archive as a very reliable source of evidence? Well, it's hard, it's very hard to film, to forge a film from the time because if you like making a fake film archive, it takes a lot of doing. Next I would do the same exercise again, but this time thinking about the sources of evidence not in terms of reliability, but in terms of their richness. Lily, I heard the girls on your table have a really interesting discussion about using a diary extract. Can you tell me about that? Well, we thought that it would be quite rich, but we didn't think that it would be very reliable. OK, so as a historian we need to think, well, how reliable is it? How rich is it? and we need to weigh up those two things before we decide whether we're going to use it. So finally, Year 5, I want you to imagine that you are the luckiest historian alive and you can find three perfect sources of evidence for your research. Which three would you choose? Off you go. These two got really high in this would be a really good lesson to do prior to a museum visit because it would equip children with the kind of words that they need to describe the exhibits they see and it would also allow them to hone in on the exhibits that are richest for their learning. So you have now got your three perfect sources of evidence for your research. Ruben, would you like to be the spokesperson for your group? Well, Film Archive and um, Artifact would like at the top of like both of our lists, so we thought they would be really useful. We also chose oral history because this person actually talking, they actually had the experience of the um, actual time. Okay, so you chose two artefacts. I want them to see the value in photographs and diaries and letters, sources of evidence that may not be quite as reliable and that may contain bias, but can tell us such a lot about past times.